I've been wanting to interview Sir Tim Clark, the president of Emirates Airline, for a very long time. During COVID, I think his airline must went through hell with limited connectivity in the Dubai hub, with lots of A380 grounded, and also no domestic market to support a recovery. How the largest international long haul airline is going to fight for its survival? Throughout the interview, I found Sir Tim Clark is a very passionate AF geek. He still remember what he ate. On his very first Boeing 707 flight back in 1960, let's hear him out. Do you remember which airplane was the very first one you ever flown on? Well, of course, I used to fly on the Stratus cruises of Pan Am with the, and uh, maybe as a baby I was looking around saying, yes, you know, they've got lounges, they've got a dining room downstairs, etc. So, in all the years, we got the 380 where it was. However. Um, no, I, I I I don't remember the first one.、Uh, I did travel a lot as a kid.、Uh, throughout my my formative years, I was going backwards and forwards on super constellations, on Britannias, all the turbo props, the DC sevens, the DC sixes, the Strats, and then the、uh, thing I remember most was the first Boeing seven hundred seven I first flew on, which was in、um, January nineteen sixty. It was an Air India, seven o seven, and that, and they were one of the first international carriers to re- get the seven o seven. Amazing! It is a carrier that was so visionary and got the. Uh, uh, so yes, I remember that one. I, I'm sorry to say, I can even remember what I ate on the aeroplane. <laughs> <laughs> so sad as it may be, in my shorts and my long socks as you travelled around as an unaccompanied minor, because I was always travelling on my own when I was seven or eight or nine. I've got a bit of a memory, like an elephant, and those kind of things. Always remember. That's probably why it shaped the way I've gone about looking at the interior design of our aircraft. Why did you choose aviation? It's like everybody who has a passion or a hobby. Why did you do that? And you actually say, "Well, I really like painting pictures. I'm really good at painting pictures. I have a gift at painting pictures. I don't know what it is." So. It's very difficult to ascertain. For me, it was a passion. I was particularly interested for some of the reasons you said. One of my brothers became a 747 captain with、uh, British Airways,、uh, so it was in the blood. My father was a seafaring; he was a, a tanker, ca- oil tanker captain. So this kind of travel thing was always in the blood. We were always flying.、Um, my the brother became a pilot. He was interested in the front end. I was always looking around the cabin, thinking, "Oh, I would here." And even as a kid, you know, I was sort of interested in the way it all worked. Um, and、uh, as I progressed through my education and、uh, you know finished my degree, I kind of really didn't want to do anything else.、Um, could I have done something else? Yes. Would I have had the passion for it? Probably no. You are taking the final A380 and two more this year ahead of the delivery schedule. So you still believe in this airplane? Oh, very much so. Yes,、uh, we were. Uh, really keen to take the、uh, the last three aircraft of our order, and coincidentally the last one that will ever be delivered、uh, this year, simply because we've、uh, refurbished the interiors or redesigned the interiors to include premium economy,、uh, and we've taken the opportunity to、uh, refresh the business class, the lounge upstairs, the showers, and everything downstairs as well. So essentially, it's a, it's a new airplane coming out. But your competitor don't, didn't believe you. Your competitor、uh, parked the three eighty.、Um, you know it was too expensive to go through a heavy maintenance sea check, and they didn't believe this airplane anymore. Well, I, I, I can't speak for them. They all have different business models as to how they use their fleet of three eighties,、uh, the numbers that they have, where they deploy them. But、uh, for Emirates, the three eighty was the linchpin for our network. We have one hundred and eighteen when we get these three. Um, and they have been so successful for not only our bottom line, but defining what we are and where we intend to be and stay in the next few decades. So, the three hundred and eighty has been hugely popular. We really、uh, decided this was the this was the the,、uh, the future for Emirates, and frankly. These aeroplanes that we're receiving later on this year will remain in the fleet until the mid 30s at least. As the environmental pressures grew with regard to what this aeroplane was actually doing,、uh, 
uh, we were able to play case simply because we can put 617 seats into a two class 380 and then the the fuel burn per per seat is actually measure, uh, a, a tad lower than it would be on some of the uh, wide body new twins that are out on the market today so environmentally she's still very solid uh, she will always be uh, a very elegant solution to congestion and slot problems at airfields and if people think that those are going to go away uh, think again uh, once we're through the pandemic air travel uh, demand will grow congestion will once again return to uh, be a major factor in airline planning and the airports that we currently serve are still going to have the same kind of pressures as they had before, whether they be in the Eastern operation, the North American, South American or European operation. So the 380 is likely to come more into its own than it has, ever has done in the next five, seven years. How many premium economy are you going to refit actually? Well, are you refitting soon? Yes, we, uh, we have a plan to retrofit 124 of our 777s with premium economy and all uh, large numbers of our 380s, those that aren't scheduled to go out of service, we're going to do the whole lot. It's a very expensive opera operation of course at a time when cash is king, but nevertheless to go forward we're going to do that. And all the new aircraft, you mentioned the 787, the 777, the 350, the 87s will all have premium economy in there. What about the 777X? What's going on with the program? When are you expecting to receive 777X? That's a very good question. The answer which I cannot give you at this stage, we are due to see our, our friends in Boeing uh, later on uh, this month or the early part of next month to try and establish what in fact is, is going on. So we are not altogether sure what's going to happen. So that's why these 380s are fairly important that we have some a continuum of fleet uh, a fleet platform which doesn't give us any concerns about when or what other aircraft are going to do for us in the future. How can we get through this without a consistent government border policies? How can you know aviation industry instill confidence for people to travel to bring people back on? Well it's a, it's a very good question and, and it is the $64,000 question out there at the moment. Uh, at the moment, it's looking pretty bleak. The uh, ability of governments to produce a standard protocol with regard to acceptability of whatever it may be in the health side of things, vaccination, PCRs, uh, antigen, I don't know, rapid flow, etc. Um, what the airlines are having to do, and what we are doing at the moment, is navigate our way through this ever-changing landscape. It's a, it's a shame that there is such a discrepancy in the vaccine programs across the planet. For instance, only about 2 or 3% of Africa have been inoculated and it's not much better in South America. So, you know, we have to sort that out as a, as a who takes the lead, the G7, the G20, I don't know. But to, to leave them there is going to be very, very counterproductive with regard to the OECD economies. See, they've got to get that right. It's very much in their interest to vaccinate the very markets they need to access and interact with. And it's no good leaving them so they can't move or do anything. So in the end, I'm hoping sense will prevail. Now, when's that going to happen? Probably not before the middle of next year, 22. Um, already we're seeing uh, countries using the vaccination protocol as the access uh, entry requirements without all the other bits and pieces. Europe has started doing it, France has started doing it, Germany is doing it. Eventually I hope that's, that's what will happen. That makes life a lot easier so we don't have the onerous imposition of testing. For instance, if you come out of the UK and go back into it, you could be faced with four PCRs and we know what they cost. If you've got a family of four, you, might, you, you won't do it. And that's all got to change if we're ever going to well, we will get there eventually, but it's going to take longer than I thought. The behaviours of flying may have also changed due to COVID. People may want to go direct flight between Europe and Asia or long haul instead of transit via Dubai. Do you think that will hurt Emirates? No, I, I, I'm afraid I, I don't subscribe to that. I, uh, this is an argument that has been used extensively for the uh, employment of say the A350 and the 787 and in the single aisle the 321 XLR 
Uh, great machines, make, make, make no mistake about it. The irony of it all is that when in the 90s we were going to both Boeing and Airbus to suggest that we needed an aircraft that would do 14 or 16 hours non-stop with a full payload, uh, it, we were kind of scoffed at because everybody said nobody will, get, nobody will do that and of course they'll want to get off and stretch their legs and all the other strange arguments but we really persevered with it and so we saw the 34500, the 777-200X as it was called then and then the capabilities of the manufacturers when they realised that, that um, people really did want to go long haul non-stop, very good. So we scored on that and we actually defined what it needed to be. Emirates model has always been that we don't only serve primary hubs. We serve first, second, third, and in some cases, fourth level airports. Then you can maximize the opportunity of city pair combinations, which you might, I use the example of, uh, say, Seattle to uh, uh, Dar es Salaam, for instance. Now, to go Seattle Dar es Salaam on a non stop 787 or 350 full of passengers is unlikely to happen. But we can get you from Seattle to Dar es Salaam with a, an hour and a half's connection here, and I can feed it with 20 other flights, which makes the Dar es Salaam sector look very profitable for us. That's how it works. Do you think Emirates will go supersonic one day? With technology as it is today, um, to scale supersonic transport, to uh, match the economics and the environmental footprint of some of the modern day twins, I would say probably not in my lifetime. Would we go supersonic? Could we go? We can go supersonic now. Um, we've got, it's not about Concorde, we've got great advances in the aerodynamics understanding, uh, the materials understanding, composites as against uh, the metallurgical solutions, propulsion has advanced, etc. But whether or not that's enough to scale to where we need to be, uh, with regard to getting an aircraft that is going to match the economics and the environmental requirements of a something like the aircraft I've mentioned, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure we're there yet. I'd like to see aircraft fly at Mach 0.9 economically, and that requires uh, changes to the wing aerodynamics, of course, and everything else. I'd like to see us being able to get more utilisation out of the assets because they are so expensive. So you're going to take an aircraft from something like 0.79 to 0.82 up to 0.9. It makes a measurable difference on the utilisation, particularly over the long distances and you can get the turn times round down. You can actually, you know, you can get one and a half aircraft instead of two. And that starts when you've got a fleet of our size. So if we could get the aircraft to fly faster, more efficiently, environmentally friendly, that's where I think we should be going rather than overcooking the supersonic argument at this stage. Do you know when you're going to retire? Or as well, long as Emirates want you to be here? I would like to see this through. Um, this particularly difficult time. It is the most difficult time in the airline's history. Uh, don't get me wrong, it doesn't require me to see it through. There are plenty of people in the business who can do the right thing. Uh, I think my boss would just be more comfortable if I was around for a bit longer. Um, that's not indefinite. I, I'm not you know, here to spend the next 10 or 15 years. Um, but personally, I'd just like to get the, the job done, set the uh, airline on a course that I know is sustainable. You must have a lots and lots of great moments and proud moments in your career. Could you give us one or two? Well, I think from a personal point of view, when I was knighted, um, by uh, Prince Charles, that was in 2014. I've had um, some wonderful moments in my career in Emirates, which well, is now 36 years plus. I've been here right from the beginning. Um, that in itself was something for any, any uh, aviation manager to be at the beginning of something as great and good as Emirates has become, uh, was something that at the time, of course, we weren't aware of, but when I look back and I realise that I was part of a team of 10, um, that, that has to be a defining moment for my career, of course, although I didn't know it at the time. But looking back, yes, when I took that decision to join, uh, it was wonderful to be part of that. And I will look back when I've finally retired and say, yes, uh, good job, well done. <laughs>